Hang on. <laughs> One show. Well done. <laughs> Say that minute. <laughs> Yeah. Are you recording? Yeah, we're recording. We're straight in there. Well done, my friends. Great idea of yours, I will point out just before. Yeah. Did you get my uh, video clip of the, uh, the, the, the the summary from the IT crowd from years ago? I don't yes. know if you used to watch that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. What a series. Here we are. Hello, David. Hi, David. <laughs> Oh, here we go. He's all, he's all serious now. <laughs> <laughs> it's coffee, David. It's just coffee. Oh, I know what that is. That's poo. Okay. <laughs> poo. Mm -hmm. Love I, it. Didn't have any, I didn't have any chocolate in the house, so I had to improvise. <laughs> oh, that's very funny, guys. Well done. As, as we run out of toilet roll, this is what happens. That is outstanding. Good, good. Well, that's that's the level of hilarity that uh, people have learned to expect from this podcast. John Hanford, thank you very much for joining us, my friend. You are a star. Mr. Mince, as ever, nice to see you. Looking bright, breezy, still alive. I just cooked lunch. You cooked lunch? What did you have? I've not had it yet. I've had to do this podcast, so hurry up. All right, okay, Jesus. No, 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 no. I made a soup. It'll last, don't worry. Good. Well, I've got my mint tea, so I'm all healthy now. That's great. John, do you want to uh, announce, uh, well, everyone should know who you are, obviously, there, but do you want to give us your uh, your bio, as they say on LinkedIn? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, John Hanford, uh, career estate agent for 20 years. Um, I apologise. Yeah, I'm uh, a passionate and enthusiastic estate agent. Um, I work with Fine and Country, we're offices all across the Midlands. Um, really proud of what we do as an industry. I think we get a unique opportunity to make a, a significant difference in people's lives. Um, so, yeah, very, very proud to say that I'm an estate agent. I'm one of those rare people that instead of a dinner party hiding in the corner, um, shying away from the fact that they're in this industry, I'm actually one of those that flies the flag and I'm quite proud of what we do. So, and, uh, of course, yeah. and of course, being six foot six, you can't hide in the corner, can you? Yeah, that is one of my accolades. I am probably the tallest estate agent in the UK. So um, at every industry event, you'll see my head bobbing above the sea of everybody else's. Well, as I'm, I'm sneaky. I go, I go under the under the radar. Actually, that doesn't work for me, does it? I don't really go under the radar. And of course, you're a um, Steve Merchant. Like you, know, you earn some money outside of estate agency. Uh, Say that again. Sorry, Simon. Was Steve Merchant look alike in your spare time? Yeah, so I collected an award on stage at uh, the Fine and Country International Awards last year and uh, a, a famous rugby player, when presenting the award, actually announced me to the rumours that he said I didn't realise that Stephen Merchant was a, was an estate agent. I, I, I won't refer to that as one of the highlights of my career, I must admit. It was uh, a sad day. But again, if I'm the Stephen Merchant, I guess you're my Ricky Gervais. <laughs> I'll take that. And with our 200 listeners on this podcast, yeah, well, that, that really delivered. What does that make you, David? Because you've always... Um, oh, well, see, I, you described me as the Jewish Gervais, then I was the Jewish Trevor McDonald, uh, then I was the Jewish... Who, who was I after that? Panda. A panda, Jewish panda Jewish bear. Panda, yeah. That's Just me. to be clear, I can't be anti-Semitic because, of course... The bloodline runs through me, so um, it's okay, is the way that it's... John was quite worried, by the way, with putting on the ch chocolate. I noticed that we only went for a little bit, just in case we looked like we are all blacking up. <laughs> <laughs> but John, tell us about positivity, because you've got this wonderful daily um, video that you do at the moment with sort of good news, and you seem to be the only person doing it. And I... I, I the, the first video of yours that I saw was I think you were in, you were lying in a hospital bed. It looked like that anyway. Um, but you were talking about the sort of an agent circle of influence, but you were also talking about the fact that the knee jerk reaction from the industry was to say we need the suppliers to pitch in and bail us out. We need the government to bail us out, and you were very much against that. Um, and you, you said that that money should be going to the NHS and that we should be doing our best to carry on. 
tell us about your life philosophy, my friend. Yeah, so uh, it, an interesting perspective. Um, I guess just before this this whole debacle with coronavirus kicked off, I I was unfortunate to to spend a uh, just over a week, eight days in in hospital in Warwick Hospital. I've got an existing health condition, so ironically, I'm one of those one and a half million people that have had a letter saying that you need to self isolate for uh, for twelve weeks. And, but prior to getting that, I was actually in hospital having treatment I needed to be in to have it intravenous uh, four times a day. And I guess it gives you a little bit of thinking time away from the business. And so my self-isolation period has probably been a bit longer than most. Um, and I was in a pretty dark place with what was happening with my treatment anyway. I was away from my wife. I was away from my three-year-old son. Um, I was struggling with the treatment that I was already getting and then obviously you've got the, this big grey cloud hanging over us of the coronavirus and the impact that that's going to have on the housing market, on the economy, um, I've got a workforce, I've got offices that I need to support, I carry the burden of the responsibilities of my buyers and sellers, people that need to move and you know they've got plans that all of a sudden are thrown into jeopardy. Um, and I could see all of the amazing things that were being done within the hospital and the brave faces that the doctors the nurses the porters the chefs the cleaners every that's making that system work is putting on and of course if you've got a little bit more disposable time on your hands you're going to spend more time in things like social media and the general consensus straight out of the traps from our industry was automatically to step into victim mode oh what is this and you know we need help we need support and you know we need a bailout we need this and you're kind of thinking no we don't you know, the people that need the support, the doctors, the nurses, the biomechanical companies, anybody that can make ventilators, anybody that can make masks or hand gel, you know, they're the people that are going to keep our economy going. And sure, I, I get it. We're in for dark times. Everybody is. We're all going to suffer a little bit here. We're going to have to cut the cloth a little bit to come through this. But actually, we've got to get our priorities in order. Um, you know, and I, and I know that... I'm not decrying what some of the agents have done in terms of tackling the issue with the, the, the galactic empire of the estate agency industry that is right move and their monopoly over the industry and their, their outrageous profit margins where, you know, they're, they're saying that they're going to defer payments. And you know, I guess it is important to try and tackle that in order to keep operating costs down so that we can put the money back into the most important people, which is our staff. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you've got to focus on what you can do and what you can influence rather than worrying about everybody else. And rather than slipping into victim mode, look at what you can do on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, when I was in the hospital, it was impossible not to be reading the news on BBC and on Sky. And I would say 99% of everything that was coming out was negative. It had this horrible undertow. And it keeps chipping away, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, it, it, you immerse yourself in this bad news. And I thought, I can't, for my own state of mental health, I can't afford to do this. I'm going to search for the good. So I started scouting through the news columns, trying to pick out anything that I thought was newsworthy that would paint a better picture of the position that we're currently in. And I've just compiled it into a daily news report of between seven and ten articles that show some of the good that's happening in the world. The breakthroughs with treatment, the breakthroughs with ventilators, um, the breakthroughs with donations that celebrities and stars and people have put their hands into their own pockets to be able to help. Companies that have adjusted their working practices. And if we spent all of our time looking at the imbeciles, the Mike Ashley's of Sports Directs, the, the Balen that runs uh, Witherspoons, you know, yeah. you're only ever going to look at the, 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 the bad of humanity. And actually, there's, there's a lot of good out there, as well as half a million people that have volunteered to be an NHS supporter um, at, their, at their hour of need. So I just thought, well, look, what started was a, a little blog with just some articles. and It's now evolved and I'm going to do a daily video. But it, I feel it's something that I can do. And I think estate agents to get through this and other guests have said it on your um, on your podcast amongst others. You listen to it. Don't pretend you've watched it. Yes, we've got a listener. <laughs> oh, 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 oh yes. I Stay healthy, John. Stay healthy. It, it was my idea to put the chocolate on my nose, David. So yes, I did realise you're a little. Yes, he's getting involved. Coffee. He's getting involved. <laughs> That's what we want. 
but yeah you, you know other people have said now isn't the time to be selling now is the time to be serving you know how can you help your community um and this is all about you, you know your your local constituency your community is your allotment and you've got to be sowing seeds for things that are going to come to flower in a few months maybe six months maybe a year's time so that the agents that come through this but anybody that's out there trying to grab and get deals now actually I, I don't think you're going to do too well. It's those that have got more of a long-term game that I think is important. So my contribution is going to be daily positive news updates yeah. with a little bit of fun with a Boris Johnson slash Donald Trump-esque wig to wear for the for the fun of it. And I'm actually I'm going to get my boy involved as well, and I'm going to get him to do a few uh, a few versions because I I'm just over under two weeks into a 12-week isolation program, so I'm going to need to find things to keep me busy. So that's you're going to do the full John Gummer then. You use your kids for your own uh, personal benefit. I don't know anybody within the industry that would stoop that low, Simon. <laughs> well, there's a couple of things that that's brilliant, John. Genuine, your outlook obviously is, 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 is fantastic considering everything that's going on and your own challenges and everything else there. One thing, we, 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 we stole one thing from you already. Obviously, one of your good news stories on your Facebook post was at the very top was that what's his face Weinstein had got coronavirus so <laughs> we did report on that straight afterwards I like the, the whole me too connotation there brilliant the other thing is David we're not doing it at the moment because let's face it we're only 30 episodes in or whatever and we don't actually have a format for the show but we do ne need dickhead of the week don't we so we need to on a Friday I think we need to decide on that don't we and um and, and have some sort of trophy. Maybe from, can... from within the industry, that's very brave. Well, you know, never mind. You're going to call them out now. I'll call them out, mate. And, well, I'll get you to do it. Can but, I ask you yeah. about somebody else who I... But just to clarify, he's not a dickhead, but obviously... I, I, do you work together, Sean Newman? Yes, yeah. So I was Sean's MD at Newman Property Services for, for many a year, um, and uh, we worked together with Fine and Country. So, so his his... He's got a sort of a brand of positivity, which um, is not just based on a f having a full bank account. It's also his outlook on life and, and exercise and just generally the, the way that he, he does stuff. Um, and I, I enjoy his videos. Is it true he sleeps in a cryo chamber? Uh, <laughs> So you talked about Peter Knight living in his Moonraker base. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we, we I saw that video of Sean um, talking about the coronavirus. is one of the, the early ones that he did during this 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 particular crisis, and he he looked to be walking out of a house that I could only describe as as Wayne Manor. <laughs> yes, it's, he, it's he is Batman, Batman, isn't he? Yeah, he is definitely, and he's he's like Benjamin Button. He just seems to be getting younger as well. But you know, Sean, for all of his faults, he he's got um, an amazing sense of purpose, and he's incredibly positive. Many in the industry will remember back. He was he was run over cycling from uh, one side of America to the other. He was raising a hundred thousand pounds for cancer research charities. And he got hit by an articulated lorry. He practically died on the side of the road. And wow. he was resuscitated by uh, some house angel bikers that were um, that just happened to be going past at the time. And I think if they were oh, there, it, it, yeah, they, they were paramedics. They were first, first aid This responders. is a fantastic origin story for like a Marvel yeah. superhero. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, but again, like the Batman, his superhero, he hasn't actually got uh, telekinesis or anything like that. It's just positivity. But... It, it, eventually when the insurance company got him back into the uk he didn't want to sit at home and mope about feeling sorry for himself so he'd go to work and he, he couldn't make it up the stairs so he, he used to tiger crawl up the stairs on all fours every single day to get into the office i can remember at one point this was when i was his md we had a, over 100 people at work for us at the time i had somebody phone up and call in sick and this was on a day where i'd met sean and I'd watched him tiger crawl on his stomach up the stairs to get into his office. And somebody had to rig me up and say, I'm not coming in today because I've got a bit of a sniffle. I've got a cough. 
<laughs> yeah, he, he, like, he, his outlook, and it, I, I guess that's shined through to me. And I think it's it's really important to to stay focused on what you can that's positive, because if you're not, you, it's a self fulfilling prophecy. You're just going to immerse yourself in doom and gloom. So I, I'm not suggesting in any way that you should ignore the government guidelines. I'm not playing down the seriousness of the situation because it it, it is incredibly serious. But just don't let it consume you and focus on the things that you can influence, whatever it may be. Your, um, point, your point, John, though, is absolutely on the, the, the. Your point there is all about balance, isn't it? And the whole point about news is, as you said, it's ninety percent because that's what get gets gets effects. I remember I went on one of those cheesy sales courses early in my career, and the guy there genuinely said, um, you know, as a sort of time manager, stop watching, you know, sort of uh, Crossroads and Emmerdale Farm and all that, all of this stuff. But he also said, don't watch the news. And, you know, tear at the newspapers, don't bother doing that. And I thought, you know, as, as a, a pseudo-political uh, idiot that I am, I thought, well, that's absolutely insane. Over the years, I think I've come to understand it. And I think actually, well, you know him well, don't you as well? John McGraw is a big believer of that. He doesn't look out. So, he, he almost goes down to such a micro level. If he can't control it, he's not interested in it until it's relevant to him at that particular moment. Well, you talk about the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule. Um, I think in terms of absorbing news, you, you're probably better to go 99-1. Be aware of the 1% that's happening out there, but that circle of influence, that 99% is where you need to spend all of your time. And you know, um, you're not, obviously you're not Ricky Gervais, actually. What was, is a brilliant, uh, uh, anyone who hasn't done it, you're actually Russell Howard, aren't you? Because he has that fantastic angle, the good news the good news story as well, where he tries to cover uplifting comedy stuff, uh, which is which is a far better way of obviously looking at the news than the depressing thing we get day in day out. Look, I've had quite a few people reach out to me and say, look, I really appreciate it, but what I'm also doing is copying and pasting it and I'm sending it in the text message to my parents oh, who good. haven't got social media and they really appreciate hearing this on a day-to-day -day basis because they're just sat at home. Their only influence is what's coming through on BBC and Sky and you're the more credible news challenges. And it's enough to suck the life out of a battery. And, you know, we've got to be aware that there are some good things that are happening out there. And there is some light at the end of the tunnel that we all need to focus on. It's going to be dark. It's going to be de depressing. It's going to be difficult. But actually, you will come through this. Um, and I think our industry potentially could evolve for it for the better. Yeah, I was going um, to say, John, what, what do you think on that point? There's a lot of people have been talking about this, really, that now is... You know, you, you don't get too many opportunities to truly rebuild your business, do you, to look at it? It tends to be iterative little changes that you make and you move towards. Now you've got a moment where you can literally break it all down and build it back up. There's obvious ones in terms I think we will all feel much more familiar doing things like, you know, remote demos, meetings or much more. The idea that people, we've had a few people, I think Glenn was the other day, we were talking about, you know, a lot of people do um, for their for their buy-to-let landlords, they do investor meetings. There's no reason that stuff can't be digital and online and reaching out to a much bigger audience. What, what else do you think are some of the fundamentals, though, that will change? Uh, I know it's a bit future-gazing, but, but um, give us... Well, well, look, you know, and, and David, I'd be interested in your views and your opinions on this. We, um, one of the things that I think is appalling in terms of an industry standard for our profession is the... Uh, is the culture of allowing people to view a property that haven't demonstrated that they've got the capability to be able to buy it. Mm. You know, if you if you bought in a German efficiency coach, look mm. at that independently, they'd say, well, that's madness. Why does that happen? Yeah. And I know from a finding country perspective, our viewing to sale conversion ratio is, is about 20 to 1. You know, we have to kiss a lot of frogs to find a prince. <laughs> you, you, know, you know what's amazing? I, I um, in doing my research for every single one of these podcasts, I know you think I just walk in late Who and make it up on the fly. I've <laughs> made soup. <laughs> but um, this, this morning I was going through your uh, back catalogue of, of stuff that you've, you've done online and um, I think you were on a, a video call with, uh, somebody from Australia, a lady. Um, Fiona. I, That's it, yeah. yeah. Fiona Blaney. That's her. Um, and she was, you know, obviously getting your perspective. Um, I think we're ahead of the Aussies in terms of how the, the virus has, has sort of taken grip over here. So she wanted to know from you how it had affected your ability to, to do certain things. And she comes across she came across to me as somebody who was looking for you to tell her 
oh yeah, well you can get away with doing viewings. We're a real essential, you know, we're an essential service. You can do this. And it, it was interesting. And I, I just thought to myself about different kinds of, of salespeople. So what I would say is that our, our demeanor as, as, as probably as, as English people is that we are, we're more reserved. So we don't necessarily want to ask the questions that are going to either get negative responses or we're afraid perhaps of upsetting somebody. I would imagine if Fiona were asking the same questions of a buyer, she wouldn't have a problem asking them, have they got the wherewithal to, to, you know, to make that transaction? Are they actually looking to commit to something today? Otherwise, she probably would not be showing them that property. And I think, and, and I see this in other countries, um, particularly sort of America, and, you know, they come across as being quite brazen sometimes, but in actual fact, they, they tend to sort of laser cut it down to actually who is capable of buying that property. Um, and so if you have to, and, and you're right, the, the viewing to sales conversion ratios are, are off the charts. And no matter how good we've all become, I think the, the, when I've been doing this for 22 years and I had never heard the phrase proof of funding, certainly 10 years ago, it wasn't, wasn't something we used to talk about. Today it's routine, but we tend to ask for it further down the line once the offer's been made rather than up front. And I just wonder if there is an opportunity for the industry to reorganize that in a way that doesn't offend people, but really sort of, you know, gets rid of the day tripping property uh, tourists. Well, well, at MAB, um, they spoke at one of my uh, boot camp, monthly boot camp sessions with Finding Country, because I run training for the, for the whole group. And you have to forgive me because I haven't got the statistics in front of me now, but there were some horrifying statistics where a third of people are looking at properties that they can't afford to buy, a fifth can afford to pay more, and a fifth can't afford to buy at all. So a large cross-section of active buyers are actually, can't, they either can't buy or they're looking in the wrong price bracket. So, you know, really, we should have an industry standard that says, and unless you've got some ability to demonstrate your proof of funds, not at the point where we're agreeing a sale, that should be before they're actually out viewing. Yeah. And again, this focus on necessity of appointments now would be a glorious opportunity for us to be able to make that, that cultural shift. And it's interesting, you talked about the comparisons. I did a, an, another international think tank on basically a professional podcast guest now. Um, I did a, 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 another one in America with a lady called... <laughs> Sorry, William. you think this is professional? Fuck <laughs> yeah. I didn't say this one was. <laughs> Uh, and, and she said in America, it is a bit more compulsory for that to happen. But I think that, you know, innovation could, can come from this, this, this time of adversity. But, you know, building on something that Peter Knight said on, uh, on, on yours, the, the future of the industry is tech to do the heavy lifting. And then you've got the more personal relationships with people. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I'm looking at, well, I've got a piece of software that I'm working with another chap who's on uh, called Ian that we're hoping um, will revolutionise the industry in terms of communication. How you heard it here first. Solicitors. A couple of exclusive did I hear there, John? No one knows about this yet. Uh, we've got the beta test. We've been working on it since before Christmas, so pre-coronavirus. It's going to be free to the industry because unless everybody has access to it and uses it, it's just not going to work and we want to improve the communication um, post sale process to help more sales go across the line and flush out problems earlier. Um, and you know, I genuinely think it could be a massive shift in the way that the industry works. So uh, I can't give you too many details of it just yet, but I'll maybe come back. Don't worry, by the way, don't worry. No one watches the show, so it's still a secret. Uh, but the good thing is when you're... <laughs> When you're ready, you need the top two super spreaders, so to speak. In to and, and nobody spreads quite like Simon Whale does. <laughs> Sorry, go you on. The super spreaders and kerfuffle is the Italy. So, uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> and, and so, j just to go back to that, though, uh, are we saying that this is it, it's something that is going to be able to identify buyers that are more serious? Is that... Uh, so that will come phase two, phase three. Um, phase one and phase two is more um, 
a, a more formal way of packaging, agreeing sales, instructing solicitors, and then managing the conveyancing process. Okay. So um, the, the idea is that the brand that we're working with at the minute will be called Property Thread. Uh, and say, for instance, when you, as, as an estate agent, if you're getting chain information, that conversation will vary from professional to professional all throughout the UK. There'll be different questions asked, different information gathered, um, different information recorded. By the time it gets from the bottom of the ch chain to the top of the chain, you've got this Chinese whispers element where bits will have been lost in translation. So is there a way that we can make that more formal and consistent so that when the estate agent at the bottom passes chain details to the next estate agent, yeah. can they then synchronize that with all of the professionals so it all feeds into one linear case where everybody can see where everybody is in that process. Almost like can log in. Like a thread. Say again, Simon. Like a thread, almost. Almost like a property thread. <laughs> but again, like a chain. Yeah. <laughs> look, so look, view my chain um, uh, and those guys, actually they're in it for selling conveyancing. Yeah. We're not. We're in it to, and you have to pay for it. We're not. You're, like, you're just connecting people and making that, you're syncing that whole process. Absolutely. A formal tick list. Do you enter the name of the buyer? When was the sale agreed? When was the draft contracts issued? When were the searches paid for? Or when were they applied for? Have they been received? Have inquiries been raised? All of these elements. And there'll be a dial for each individual property and everybody can log in and see exactly where they are. So they'll have to sign GDPR disclaimers to say, I want mine to be a transparent sale. I want everybody to see and know where I am. Yeah, yeah that's okay. Say that again, Simon. I was just going to ask if there was a GDPR uh, element there that obviously holds it up. So you have to have some sort of, yeah, you have to have some sort of consent form on there. But yeah. Yeah, we've, we've met with solicitors to discuss it and obviously brainstorm the idea with them. What they don't want to be doing is filling out loads of boxes and filling out loads of information. But they also don't want to be taking calls from several different estate agents and That's buyers true. and sellers. Yeah, very true. There is one central source of information that everybody can log into and go well that's where i am with everything this is what's outstanding it will streamline the whole process for everybody involved it's happened at some stage and hopefully it is with you john you know um because it's just always been the problem with getting to that critical mass point hasn't it you identified there at the beginning and i've had a number of conversations over the years with those some of those other you know the kind of pretenders to the throne or all the people trying to achieve this and I've sat in meetings when they've been with some quite big agents and the agents have sat there and said, this is absolutely fantastic. I can see this. I can, I can understand how important it is to have everyone on board. He says, well, I'm not signing up if those bastards down the road are, are doing it. And that's always been the problem, hasn't it? And I think you, you, you've got to get beyond that and see the, the benefit to all. Otherwise, it's never going to happen. Well, you, you know what? I think that John's point is that it, it's... I think all the other pretenders previously, they, there was a sub agenda to Making streamlining the process. They were either trying to sell, you know, um, professional services along the way, um, or they would be doing some of the sales chasing, whatever it may be. But I think if you are gen genuinely trying to introduce something that hopefully should be, uh, should become a, an indus industry standard, if it's and if it's free at the point of of use for all those agents there should be no reason in, in fact if my competitors had it and i wasn't on it i would it want to know why i'm not on it. It, it, it it won't work unless every professional has got access to it and can use it it won't work it's no good having exclusivity because if a, if a, if an estate agent is filling out the information at the bottom of the chain but the agent at the top isn't working you're diametrically opposed to each other so the idea is that it can it can feed through and benefit everybody and also buyers and sellers. You know, they're left in the dark. There's a lot of terminology that's used within the conveyancing process that bamboozle people. And we've created this list of terminology where people can click into little bubbles, an infographic will pop up and it'll explain what a TR1 document is. And again, not just the buyers and sellers. I think there's a lot of estate agents and unfortunately, maybe some solicitors that don't know the meaning of some of these terms. And again, we can monetize it to bankroll the project with a little banner ad on each of those little pop-up things. So we don't need to 
break and pillage the industry in the same way that the Galactic Empire right move do um, in order to be able to like, take ridiculous amounts and sums of money. We can make this work without the necessity to do that. So I think it could be a force for good. I think this is now is a really good time just to announce that um, we finally announce and announce our, our podcast sponsors right move. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Congratulations. Well, actually, I was going to come back to your dickhead of the week, and uh, I'm going <laughs> to make a nomination if that's okay. I think Hart. Um, Paul oh, Smith is going to take oh it yes. Surely. Do you I'm know what? That's it. Changes. That's it. Um, I've got a little bit it's piece of now. good news. I've I got a text through from a, a property broker and somebody that watches every single episode of our of our show. He texts me every time he watches it. It's a, a, a chap I went to school with actually. His name is Josh Rose, uh, and he has uh, he's working on a deal. Very very worried because his pipeline was was falling through because because valuers were not getting out to value the property. But he's had a a text update today from a lender. Um, from a mortgage broker and it basically says I've had an update from their lender who has confirmed that due to coronavirus issue valuers are not visiting properties in this instance though a desktop valuation has been instructed which should take around 48 hours for it to be returned to the lender on the assumption that all is okay uh, it will then uh, we will then receive the mortgage offer hopefully by the end of this week so lenders and valuers are seem to be in some cases at least reacting relatively positively and trying to come up with with alternative solutions which obviously when you do a desktop valuation i think you're always going to have a, there's an ele element of increased risk but i suppose if your loan to value ratios are all right you can get away with it um, but it's good to see there's a little bit of resilience there so another little big piece of good news for you john yeah no that's good we've had reports of that as well um and again it was interesting a, a week to 10 days ago loan to value ratios from the lenders dropped drastically uh, yes. you know, if it was 40 50 percent there was a possibility already i've seen evidence santander halifax we're back up to the rounds of reason where we're at 75 percent and i've even heard of 80 percent so I think there will get to a stage where the government will have to step in in order to be able to allow the housing market to limp along. Um, even if it's not at full capacity, you know, if a family have been in self-isolation for three weeks, why couldn't a surveyor pop round there to do a to, to conduct evaluation? The risk is going to be so minimal. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know in other parts of the world they've, they've introduced elements like this it seems contradictory to allow builders to rock up to a building site yeah. and all work together and eat in a canteen together, but you couldn't get somebody, a surveyor, visiting a property or even a vacant property. Because you know that builders don't wash their hands ever, not even no, when I, they go home. I, I, love, I love the idea of this concept of them being socially responsible with social distancing, <laughs> which basically means they can't lift anything that's smaller than two metres. So you just imagine them working on a site together. As one of them's walking down the ladder, they stop and look around and say, actually, two metres, can you just move away as you're putting the bottom of it? It's, it's ridiculous. Um, we were talking about the Aussies earlier, actually, John, and one thing that when I was just over there, literally got out, I think it was the, the day or two before the borders closed, although um, sometimes wish that I got caught there. But anyway... The, uh, one of the things they were blaming us for quite amusingly was at that stage they were still able to do a certain amount of business and of course you know the in the inefficiencies of our market amuses them no end you know they for ages they pretty much all do open houses don't they but of course this had forced them to go back to private viewings so they were just like fucking this pandemic has basically made giving us the shit uk system to, to, to <laughs> I called this uh, 10 days ago when I did the webinar with Fiona Blaney and I said, look, you guys, you're notorious for doing auctions on the garden of the property immediately after showing everybody and then drawing everybody into a bidding war. That's gone. That's going to be out the window. And she was horrified and she said, well, surely not. And I said, absolutely. <laughs> at best, you're going to go back to individual viewings and that's at best there's a possibility that that, that, that might be knocked on the head. Um, but uh, but yeah, it, it, 
that's just going to be the culture moving forward, I think, for the foreseeable future. We, we banned open houses more or less immediately as soon as this happened. We were still doing individual viewings with gloves, uh, with masks and with shoe covers. But again, even that eventually became the, the socially irresponsible thing to do. So we had to knock that on the head as well. And we're reverting to virtual viewings. A colleague, Carl, has just sold a property in Staffordshire to somebody that's never seen it. The vendor did a virtual walkthrough and we've agreed and packaged the sale. It would have been unheard of um, a couple of weeks ago, but now it's a necessary evil. Unbelievable. Yeah. John, the... Um in your own business, um, do, do you have, um, I know in Newman they do, don't they? They, they You've got a lot of, uh, not self-employed, what do you call them? Um, self-employed. <laughs> self, sorry, self-employed then. So, so uh, do you do that as well in some of the fine and country brands that you, you look after as well? How, yeah. what, what, how does, how has this furloughing affected, affected that whole process? What have you been able to do there in terms of, um, in terms of that for, for these people? So uh, being completely transparent, our administration team, our accounts team, our head office, we were pretty much lost the ability to be able to function. We've um, we, we furloughed those roles with a view to reinstating them all at the earliest opportunity because obviously all of our office network is shut down. Mm -hmm. our, our workforce, our cold face agents are all self-employed, um, which is great because it, it's meant that over the years, and this isn't a fairly new concept to us, we've, we've been doing this now for 12, 13 years. It means that we attract and recruit um, yeah, self-disciplined, driven, innovative individuals that are very ambitious, um, they're very forward thinking. Yeah. They, they need very little micromanagement because they're, they're responsible for their, for their own business generation. So a lot of them have been working from home already. You know, they're, they're, they're portable, they work on the road, they work with their phones and their laptops. So they are operating as they were before. And we've actually, on, on a Monday morning, I do, uh, I've implemented this almost immediately as soon as the coronavirus impact hit. I do a Monday morning motivational meeting at 10 o'clock where I've got to put everybody together on a Zoom call. I think I had just under 40 people in the last meeting on Monday and they're all sharing results and success. And in the last seven days, we've done 12 deals. So 12 sales agreed. It was all from historic legacy stuff. Yeah. But we're selling houses at 2.4 million, 1.35 million, 800,000, 900,000. We've agreed sales to cash buyers where we've negotiated into the memorandum that they're not going to have survey or searches on the proviso that they get it through within a certain time scale. Uh, Michelle in our Droitwich Spire office, she yesterday got Old Croft Cottage across the line um, from sale agreed to exchange of contracts in 16 days. Um, so those agents, they are... They live by the sword and die by the sword because they're commission only roles. So they're incredibly motivated to get these deals across the line. So the, our, our sales workforce haven't been furloughed. If they do that individually, it will be through their own businesses. Okay. And um, in terms of this, this self-employed model, um, I think Keller Williams is, is one of those names that you see popping up again and again. And, and again, it's very much a, a similar sort of deal, isn't it? Do you think that's the future of estate agency? Are we going to see sort of the, the traditional branches fall, fall to the wayside and, and people operating from home or off their own back? So, so look, whether you're employed or self-employed, I think the, the future of the industry is, um, is licensing. You know, that's got to be the future. How, how is it not a requirement to have a qualification to work as an estate agent? You know, imagine how much more professional the industry would be if somebody's got to be able to demonstrate a minimum set of standards in terms of their ability to be able to do the job. So whether you're employed or self-employed for me is irrelevant. The future of the industry should be a qualification. It should be licensing. Every country in the world has got it apart from us. You know, our, our whole system has barely changed in over 300 years. It's God, so think, archaic. Think about me being able to become an estate agent. Does that what does what does that fill you full of joy that someone like me could become an estate agent tomorrow uh, I, I, you would make a great estate agent i just you would have a better tie collection than you know down <laughs> yeah not the shoes though yeah. <laughs> But yeah, for, for me, that's the, for us, the, the, the change to self-employed, it came some time ago. And you talk about Keller Williams. We, we went for six or seven consecutive years to the, to the NAR conference in America. 
uh, we went there to steal ideas and best practice and bring it back and implement it to our business. I was a, a guest speaker for two consecutive years at ARIC in Australia. And again, you go to those different countries with different cultures and they look at the way that we do things. And it was it was a significant change. I remember talking to agents in America. In, in our country, we're hated as a profession. We charge ridiculously low fees. You then go to America and actually realtors are, are relatively well respected. Mm -hmm. They charge great fees. They charge a fee for the buyer and the seller. And I think you've got this this relationship between what you charge and the, the service that you provide. So those self-employed agents that have got more skin in the game, they tend to do a better job. And here you've got the corporate mentality, which is a pretty menial basic, pretty menial commission, very little skin in the game, very little commitment to the job. It attracts school leavers. And again, you know, I was relatively young when I started as an agent myself it's the wrong calibre of person to be dealing with what is somebody's um, most expensive asset. I think that's why our, our industry has got such a bad reputation. So. And, so, and so when it, when is that going to change? So I, I have noticed a vast improvement in quality of, so there's always been sort of an, an elite upper circle, the sort of people that would go to all the award ceremonies and, and you know, rub shoulders with Simon Whale at a bar. Um, but for the rest of us, sort of independents, pro provincial agents, the standard had just been whatever you kind of received and inherited from the guy that taught you. And you were lucky if that was good. Um, but now I see that standard has, has been massively raised, that the standard amongst smaller independents is much better than it ever was before. People are investing in training. People are trying to increase their fees that the the rhetoric and the sort of dialogue that they're having with um vendors has, has changed maybe in reaction actually to the sort of online agents such as purple bricks um and so you see a much better quality caliber of agent but it still doesn't seem to filter down to members of the public we are still the most despised of professions and I just wonder, is that, do you feel that licensing is what we need in order to give us that air of respectability? Yeah, I do. You know, and that, that parasite persona that the public have got of our industry where we're, we're, we're pariahs, I think actually in some instances it's kind of justified in terms of the way that we, we operate and the way that we we manage people's expectations. And I think if you had licensing, it would it would make a significant shift in that public perception where, and I'll use financial services as an example. When the CMAP qualifications came into force, what actually happened was 20, 25% of the advisors left the industry. The, the charlatans, the people that cut the corners, that didn't do the job properly, yeah. they thought, you know what, I, I've got no appetite for this. I don't want to do it. I don't want a qualification. I probably wouldn't pass the test. I'm going to leave and I'm going to do something else. So naturally, the level of service from the remaining 75%, it improved overnight and they became more professional. Those individuals, they earned more money. They did a better job. Their client banks grew. And actually, the financial services industry is better for it. I can see the same thing happening within the estate agency profession and the companies that invest in the training, that look after their people, um, that give them the tools that they need to be able to deliver a better service. They're the ones that will shine. And that's how the cream will rise to the top. And, you know, rather than this race to the bottom in terms of fees, actually, agents can start to command a, a decent fee for, for what they do. Um, and then they can reinvest that back in the business, back in the marketing, back in their people to be able to, to, to deliver a better job. And so it's, it's, it's an important change that needs to come. And so then the only area of the industry that will be left for people that have no qualifications, uh, no barrier to entry whatsoever, Property. will be the supplier market. <laughs> Welcome to my world. There's a couple of things um, there, gents. The first of all, David, I think you know in, you answered your own questions actually with some of the earlier podcasts. You were having a bit of a, um, a one of your projects was to be detailing just how many cases of impropriety there were. People jumping into the client account. Yeah. Yeah. The list, you know. Uh, I mean that those stories obviously are just background noise that keeps the public's opinion, they are, they are not changing, are you? So you're absolutely right. That has to change across the board to get rid of those. 
I think, though, on a more positive note, in terms of, and what, let's call you the Muggles, David. You mentioned your. We've got the. We've got as as ever. We've got the top. The cream's on top here, and we've got you down there, the Muggles. But even there is now, and you've got to thank social media, I think, for it. And the Aussies again, unfortunately, were ahead of us there with the likes of Tom Panos, McGrath, leading these podcasts. Um, vegan shit, he'll fucking he'll go mental if I don't mention vegan. Um, that over here now, social media has enabled people as well for no cost to be able to self improve them. We shouldn't mention them in a positive light, but you know, our friends at the Estate Agency podcast is a classic example of that, isn't it? Um, you know, being able to go out there, putting out their own time, you've got groups that you can get on very, very cost effectively with the likes of Stephen Brown. I know you're in one of those groups. You've got the likes of Peter Knight at a slightly, you know, different level as well. So th there's absolutely no, no, no uh, excuse for not finding a training and development plan that will fit you. And I think the thing that we have been uh, we have been uh, guilty of, or the industry has been guilty of in the past, is everyone's spoken about how important training and development is. And as you saw in 2008, the minute it got tight, the first thing that got cut was training and development costs. And I don't know if you saw the, um, the, the there was a little thread going around on Facebook yesterday, I think it was, John, where uh, Tom McGee, I Tom, uh, was making mention, he actually reached out that wanky four tops phrase to Peter Knight, uh, where he asked, he said he remembered that Peter had actually launched way back when a online learning tool, essentially. And of course, you were one of the first people that, that went into that. And it genuinely had the potential to be a, a real resource for the industry, didn't it? Unfortunately, the, the, the economics of the model fell away because just no one was willing to pay the subscription. And back then it cost a huge amount to do the video to get it on board, wasn't it? But those sorts of tools now are just second nature. You've got Charlotte Campbell, at Able Agent, where you're able to get on very quickly, very easily, self-training, a whole host of different matters. You know, not even if you even if you wanted to do it for absolutely zero cost. And, and this goes not just for a state agency, but goes for anything. If you wanted to know how to build a car, yeah, you, you will go on YouTube. Some guy will teach you how yeah. to do it. But there is literally hours and hours and hours of people like you and I and, and, and a, a podcast whore who will go on any show, right? Yeah. But there, there are hours of people like that who, who give it away for free because it's there. And if you've got the time to sit and listen to Tom Panos, you can do. Um, I know he does his real estate gym. I know that Josh Vegan's got um, his premium content as well. But in actual fact, if you do enough digging around on YouTube, you'll find all of that content springs up yeah. from time to time and you'll get lots of it. I, I listened to a, an interview with, um, I think John McGraw, where he's talking about uh, justifying fees. And, you know, this is all stuff that I've heard before, but it doesn't hurt to hear it again and, and said in a slightly different way. Um, and you can do it for absolutely zero cost. Yeah. Uh, it's the most tremendous resource that we've got. I mean, I ask you guys, how long do you spend yourselves looking to learn new stuff like that? I mean, I know we can look, get lost down what rabbit holes, you know, getting lost on, on sort of YouTube now and again, but do you actually specifically set aside time to look at this or is it just as time uh, allows and, and a follow-up to that sorry is how, do you encourage your teams to do that as well no okay i'll, I'll, I'll take the mantle there um so there's that famous quote by abraham lincoln if you give me five hours to chop down a tree i'd spend three hours sharpening the axe yeah um you know and i think that's so true there's so many agents out there that would be slugging through market appraisals and listings you know, battling to get 1% fees. And you know, we're, we're really proud of the way that we work and operate in fine and country. We're, we're two and a half percent plus VAT. You know, um, we get that, we command those fees. Uh, our average sale price is about 785,000. We won't be chipping our fees moving forward for the challenging market that's coming. We'll be reinforcing the fact that, agent, uh, that vendors need to, to pay a premium for a professional. Now, I don't think we get <coughs> VAT if we just rocked up to valuation appointments and expected to get it. It takes time sharing ideas and best practice, yeah. um, building our marketing strategy, and making sure that we've got a, a, a product that's that's 
worth that fee so that you can b believe and behave like you're worth two and a half percent so for me training and development is really important and i run a four-day course within the finding country network called the four-day induction boot camp course we put all new starters through it on a monthly basis we get everybody together we pick a particular topic and turn it inside out i listen to podcasts i watch videos i watch youtube videos i try and absorb as much information as possible and there is so much good content out there you just mentioned loads of people and it'd be it'd be a travesty not to mention somebody like christopher Watkin, you know i know you've had on your show recently yeah. like the amount of content that he's supplied to our industry there's just no excuse for people not to spend their time learning growing um, and obviously building their skill set so that when they're on a valuation appointment and you've got that unscripted theatre, they've got all of the tools and resources that they need to draw upon to be able to win the instruction and get it across the across the line. So for me, you know, I, I don't think it's unreasonable to spend 20 to 30 percent of your time sharpening the saw. That's that's good. And you encourage your team to do that as well. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. It's, a, it's the best use of your time. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll go back to um, I'll go back to football as a as a tangible example, which is interesting because I absolutely blame football for the coronavirus. But I'll come back to that in a second. Um, <laughs> we win, we win the league. <laughs> if you, I'll come back to that in a second. If you look at our last national football campaign, you could tell that that England football team had been practicing penalties. They didn't just rock up to that tournament and then start, they'd, they'd spent time on the training field, running through the process, running through frame of mind, um, running through technique. And the, the difference in confidence was unbelievable. Yeah. It was it was visible. And that's the same for an agent going out onto the coalface, conducting a valuation appointment. The agents that have been well-trained, they're well-versed, they know how to overcome objections. They know how to structure their appointment. They know how to prepare it, deliver it they're the ones that will walk away with a successful result so for me i think it's really important but yes football is definitely to blame for coronavirus obviously liverpool was building up ready to win the premier league for the first time ever and the whole footballing community all said if there is a god you've got yeah. to step in now and prevent this travesty from happening well done and, 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 and like that bloke on the stag do that goes a little bit too far and Kills a hooker. God creates crew. <laughs> oh, oh. oh, for a minute, for a minute, I thought, oh, we're going to embrace the religious crew, and you've just gone and, and, and pushed them away again. You've done so well. Forty nine minutes without a dead hooker. <laughs> remember, remember in the hashtags, David, dead hooker, <laughs> dead hooker episode. Yeah, got bait. God said, hold my beer. Oh, I'll, I'll stop Liverpool winning the league. <laughs> country <laughs> no, it's, it's okay only 100 people will get to see this and, uh, but, but but you know what this this is very that analogy is very interesting because because obviously liverpool were in terms of mindset in terms of management in terms of how the players handled themselves they were absolutely uh, you know out of reach from, from other people the question is now having hit that pause button yeah, are they going to be ready to come back in on the same mindset? And the same goes for all of those agents who, have, who are at home now. And you can either spend that time watching Netflix and cooking lunch for your family and doing the occasional podcast with Simon Whale, or you can also spend that time um, honing your scripts, your dialogue with vendors, uh, and being ready for when, when the league comes back. Because otherwise... If you stroll back in and think, oh, we'll just, you know, we'll be back where we were, it's um, not going to be that way. We were just on another uh, uh, webinar earlier, and one of the questions actually was put out, uh, it was actually raised back, it was by somebody who had been ex in the military, and they were talking about their saying was there was train hard, fight easy, which is a fantastic, you know, way of thinking about it, isn't it? In times of peace was the analogy, is if you sit back and let yourself grow fat and everything else there, when it comes round to it, you're in the worst possible state. That's the very time you need to be actually working to your premium so that you can hit the floor, the floor running when it, when it comes back round again, isn't it? So, so Tom Panos used this analogy. If he said, if you, if you sweat in training, you don't bleed in battle. Um, I, I, that's, that's so true. You know, if you, if you don't... You put that time in and you reap the benefits of it later. So uh, just two, two things I've got, uh, John. Uh, given your deep, deep knowledge, probably about as good as anyone actually of the Australian market, 
Um, just summarise for me what you think the Aussies do best and what the Brits do best. Oh, so you, you're going to hate me for doing this. Um, that other estate agency podcast, that that crew. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, spit. Sorry. Um, and David, can I just say your your impression of Stephen Brown is uh, is a a one. That's as good as anything that I've seen. But they um, they had Troy Malcolm uh, in the UK a few weeks back, and I'm a big fan of McGrath. I love everything they do. I've been to see Troy a couple of times, and there was there was one thing that he said at that last session, um, and it really resonated with me. And you've got to remember, fine and country, we're proud of the fact that we're in 325 locations all across the world. I've got fine and country offices myself, and he said, "Your offices don't mean dick anymore." He said, "Your you." you your, your new shop window, and this was pre-coronavirus, is your social media. And, uh, and I, I, I kind of knew that concept already, but it really sunk home with me that day. And then everything that's happened in the weeks afterwards now has cemented that concept even more. So our physical office network is irrelevant. Like literally, it is irrelevant, and it will probably be irrelevant in the future. So if you want to be visible, you, the way to reach your local constituency, your local community, is through social media. And you have to be present and visible every day. You have to be committing, um, you know, sharing their content of local businesses, liking, getting involved. Um, you, you need to be doing presenter-led videos. It's something that we've done for years. But, you know, Christopher Watkins talked about this where he said that if you see a celebrity die and you feel for them, even though you've never met them, it's because you feel that you've got a connection with them because your, your, your subconscious can't differentiate between the digital and the real version. Well, that's what we've got to do as estate agents. So you've got to be getting content out there all of the time. It's another reason why I'm doing these daily positive news updates. So if there's one thing that I think the Australians do really, well that we maybe need to learn from and maybe not all of them maybe just the, the, the better agents is that they've started to embrace this idea that their new window displays their social media um, and you can have a massive you used to have to pay 100 grand a year to have a massive big corner premises with loads of window display but actually now you can get that for free and i'm going to come back to the galactic empire of, uh, of the supplier of the estate agency I'll industry right now so my my largest sale in 2019 was a property called the Marble House, a Jacobean property in Warwick. Um, set the record on land registry, the most expensive sale. In the first week of marketing, we had just under 10,000 views from traditional marketing methods. So findingcountry.com, Rightmove, Zoopla, Prime Location. Yep. My social media campaign had 65,000 views. So 65,000 views versus less than 10,000. I think it was about nine and a half thousand. And how did the investment, how did the investment between the two? So remarkably, I shot five, seven individual videos for the Marble House. I did one feature production for the portals. I did a guide to Warwick, a guide to Jacobean properties, a guide to buying a property with an annex, gardens. All of these videos fed into the campaign. And then we did ad manager campaigns targeting a certain demographic of people. So with the video production and with the ad manager campaign and everything else, I probably spent the best part of two thousand pounds. Okay. So it's not an insignificant sum of money. The buyer had never registered with Rightmove. They'd never registered with Finding Country. They'd never registered with Zoopla. They'd not actively viewed any houses. They had no intentions of moving. And I hijacked their timeline with a video production. And they were sat there one weekend and went, well, that looks lovely. Should we go and have a look? Awesome. And a month later, they bought it independently of sanding and had completed on the property. That so, is awesome. I, you know, Simon, because obviously you're an affiliate of the Galactic Empire, you're a big advocate of theirs and say that, um, you know, you actually think they're good value for money. I think they are, if they don't change their model, they're going to cease to exist because oh, agents are going to start to get wise. I do think they, they're value for money, but I also have been outspoken and I've told them themselves, I believe they make this, you can make good profits, you can make bad profits. Good profits are sustainable profits. Bad profits is essentially price, price gouging for the wants of another thing. I truly believe, and I've told them this as much as trying to be, 
you know, trying to be liked by everybody, which is my shameless narcissism, is telling them that I truly believe their long-term survival needs to take the edge of expectation off those prices. And if they come down somewhat, it will take make most of this stuff go away and they will be protected. Because I still, I've said it endlessly, the minute that somebody feels they can do without Ryan Move or there's a competitor, you will see the collapse of a £6 billion company quicker than any other business in history. I, I think the foundations are crumbling. And um, I've, I, 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 social media will now fill that gap. You couldn't, you couldn't walk away from Right Move 12 to 18 months ago without the same degree of confidence that you could now. And I'd happily switch them off because I'm already starting to see that I'm getting more leads and more inquiries. I can target people more specifically. I can use a more co uh, cost effective structuring of my marketing campaign. I can get just as good credible click through data. Um, and I've got the tangible results, results to be able to demonstrate it. John. So what's your spend at the moment, say, on, on, on the port, traditional portals against, uh, against social? Uh, so we're less on on uh, social um, because the, so you, you've got two things. You've got what I would call presentation and then you've got exposure. So yeah. our presentation wouldn't change whether we're putting it into a portal or whether we're putting it into social. So, for instance, we are going to produce a video. We're going to get a drone pilot. We're going to get a videographer. We're going to get a script put together. So we're going to do that regardless of whether it's going to go to the portals or whether it's going to go to the social or with what we do, we send it to both. A so a large, sorry, yeah. Simon. That's a fixed cost, if you like, of, of the listing. Yeah, absolutely. We get a contribution from the vendor. So they, they, they spend as much money as we do putting that, that, that together. But, you know, for me, video is so important. If a picture tells a thousand words, a video tells a thousand pictures. Mm -hmm. So you, can get more across in 60 seconds two minutes with a video than you ever would be able to with one of our 24 page brochures and of course these days people are doing property with one of these they're not looking at a brochure so you know they're looking at a smartphone or, or a tablet so the video production element is uh, is incredibly important for us um, so then the actual expenditure of what we're spending on the portals versus what we're spending on social I'd say social is a tenth of what we're spending on the portals mm -hmm. and the results are better from social than they are from the portals so there is that massive imbalance so if i had to kill one of the two off tomorrow the portals would go wow. so i i don't think it's i don't think it's sustainable for them to carry on with their current charging structure as it is because they're not adding the value for money that they used to what, and what i think is really interesting here john is you know we've heard a lot from people who are saying they're coming off um and have come off in the past the problem has been that pete and i made the point a lot of the times it was a bit it was almost shooting a, a, the the campaign in the foot because these people would come off right move and actually go out of business a couple of months later and so it would leave right move to say oh they were rubbish agents anyway you know whereas actually you know you're talking about here one of the very best agents in the in the business winner of countless awards and obviously two and a half percent fees and all the great stuff you do just saying there explicitly if there was a choice between them you would be they would be the ones to suffer that's 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 a game-changing moment i think for me in terms of understanding you know the, the where the dynamics of where this is where this is shifting and why it does feel different for me this time a lot of people keep saying oh it's going to be like the last time you know the agents will blink at the 11th hour but it, I think the, the stats and the science are backing it up now, aren't they? The reason why you can do without it. And, and I'll tell you something else. I think that the uh, it, the door is, is not entirely shut for Zoopla either. Um, they are extremely nervous at the moment. They're trying to posture in a way that they're not. But their constant sort of the last couple of days, their ad campaign has been, you know, you've now got a very limited amount of time to commit to us. We're offering you this fantastic deal but they are under fire as well um so i think both of them may take a hammering their, their business strategy is the stockholm syndrome you know they don't have customers they have hostages yeah. you know and they're, they're, they're almost the, the way that they're encouraging you to stay with them it's almost like a, a husband that beats their wife you uh you, you'd never make I have it no idea about, about these things yeah obviously i don't i've heard 
the uh, you, you'll never make it on your own without me. You know, what a horrible relationship to have with somebody. And, and that's what the portals have done for years over the estate agency profession. But actually, the same thing's going to happen to them is what happened to newspaper press with the majority of local publications. Very true. Estate Very agents true. have that necessity <laughs> for it. They have a role play. I just sorry, it just came to me there. Do you think they have a role play at like um, at right move? And they say, well, what you can say, you can't say. So if somebody, let's just say, somebody, an estate agent, was to say to you, "I'm thinking of moving," what do you say? Oh fuck you! <laughs> 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 do what you start to clench your fist and like you, you, your eye twitches but yes. they but they do I, i've seen right move reps get get angry i've seen i sat through um a hour and a half long meeting with the right move rep where they quoted a price for a package again and again and again and again i actually wrote it down on the piece of paper and i, I held it up and go is that is that right yes yes that's right you get to the end of it and uh he looked at it, he goes, actually, I need to call head office to find out what the price is. I said, well, you've mentioned it 36 times. <laughs> We've written it down. Um, and he, he said, well, I'm sorry, I, I can't, I can't honor that price. It's, 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 it's more than that. And, and I said, do you not appreciate that if I had sat through the same presentation with a vendor and had said, look, the price of your house is going to be X and my fees are going to be Y. Yeah. And then I changed it to Z right at the end. It's gonna, it's gonna end in bad. Well, that's just the way it is. You, look, you need us. You need us. And it's, it is Stockholm syndrome. You're right, David. You know the the the, the only other people that do a, a close like that, as far as I'm aware, is the mafia. It's like either your either your brains or your signature are gonna be on this on this document by the time you leave. I tell you what's really interesting though, isn't it? And this is the the thing they should be they should really be if they don't i'm sure they do but analyzing the efficacy of their account managers because if you have a good account manager you know you hear the same things from from the agents in terms of oh it's you know it's bad and everything else there but those ones that are down, able to tone down the arrogance up the empathy crucially here they get a bit, dare I say it, where we were in the repeat world. We were expensive, but we certainly never got hit with the same level of antipathy that was there. And I think that's all that people people are after, really, isn't it, a lot of the time. it's. I, I suspect it's because so many of those account managers have come as pure hard salespeople from the likes of Yellow Pages. Literally, it's, you know, we're going in, we're going to upsell, 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 rather than what, in my view, an account manager is, is helping your clients get the best out of the service and i think it, that depends, it depends where they're getting these account managers from you know years ago they used to say that um traffic wardens were the bastard children of policemen and prostitutes um you know it, it it's now right move account managers that it's like they've taken bailiffs and prostitutes and gone <laughs> right that's it you go in threaten them take away their stuff if they don't like it and and that's the way it goes. If any, if any uh, listeners or viewers out there would like to send us in the imaginary CV for a, a <laughs> account manager, and please do bullet point that those features want you. We'll share those on the next few shows. <laughs> so I've I've got a um, I've got a story about years ago when we started to gravitate away from newspaper advertising. Yeah. And uh, I can remember I discussed this with my team. And at one point, we'd have six to seven full pages in the local row. Full page for a property. We'd have the floor plan, internal photographs, a really big feature. We'd, we'd go to town with it. We saw it as a staple part of what we did. And we'd monitor the responses with calls. And you started to think, well, actually, there's better, better ways that we can spend our money and focus our time where we can do videos. I talked to the team. I said, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull newspaper advertising. And the reaction from my staff was, you can't do that. Yeah. You know, it will close us down. We won't get any valuations. The vendors will go mad and I will push back. And I said, okay, okay, all right, we'll, we'll wait. We won't do anything. And I waited for two months. And then I spoke to a lady that I work with, still work with her today, called Nicola Wright. I pulled her to the side and said, Nick, I want you to pull a newspaper advertising. She went, but John, you had that big meeting and all the stuff, they all kicked off and they said that they didn't want to do it. And I said, yeah, no, I know all of that pull it. I want you to pull next week's ads and every week thereafter. I said, I'd like to see how long it takes before somebody clocks that we're not advertising in the newspaper. Yeah. How long do you reckon it was? A month. Two weeks? 
it was about eight weeks before wow. one of the staff members came up to me and said, do you know that we're not in the newspaper this week? I said, <laughs> we haven't been in there for two months. That's ridiculous. And they didn't believe me. They had to go back and get previous copies. Not a single vendor, not a single buyer, none of my staff members. No one knew. Yeah. No one cared. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think we're at that tipping point with the portals where they their, their perception of their importance is beyond the, the reality of the situation and there are other mediums for attracting potential buyers in and I know that like, Dominic Sibiani and FBM and Pembrokeshire and Wales at one point not so long ago they all pulled in all the agents all pulled together and then someone spoiled the party by starting to advertise with Brightmove and then everybody felt the need to go back in again I don't think you've got that same sentiment now I think there's been a significant shift when you were telling that story, I was thinking about uh, Dom. Not that I think about Dom all the time when anyone shared a room with him. But the, um, but the you were quite right. When they, I remember he, he spoke about he, when they were coming off it, and he was obviously nervous. And he said, I, "You know, wait, I don't know. I don't know how long it's going to take for them to find us. Is it going to be a week? Is it going to be two weeks?" There, he, he came out and he said, "It wasn't even twenty-four hours. You know, they will gravitate towards the stock." In the quickest possible in the quickest possible time and that was it was fascinating but as you said what was weird there was one did break ranks and uh, and then they all went back onto it didn't they which was a bit of a, a bit of a shame really jonathan before we we say goodbye to you because i don't want to take up the whole of your day um on for 12 weeks <laughs> yeah, I've got, I've got, do you know what i've got a 10 ton of aggregate on the driveway that i need to wheelbarrow to the garden <laughs> keep me here for as long as possible <laughs> Um, what would you like this episode to be called? Uh, uh, dead hooker on a stag do. <laughs> Done. 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 Chucky knows. Chucky Done. Knows. John, one thing we would say is, and actually we're going to take advantage of you being uh, locked away. Um, I was hoping we'd, we'd do it today, but I did hear you talk very, uh, it was, and I'm not just saying this, it was probably the, the speech of the day at the uh, Fine and Country Bash. Um, Christ, it seems like about three years ago, but that was only a couple of months, wasn't it? Um, and you did detail for the rest of the, the, the people there, some of the top, I think it was about 276 tips, it felt like. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was 20 top tips for 2020. Oh. Remarkably, one of them wasn't washing your hands. <laughs> <laughs> I woke up halfway through. Number 47. <laughs> oh, I, I know there is something that I wanted to ask you. TikTok. What? Yes. You see, I think Simon could become TikTok famous very easily. Yeah, but they keep threatening to, 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 to... You've dabbled with it, haven't you? Uh, no, so I somebody approached me and said, oh, one of your properties has just been featured on TikTok, um, and they sent me a link to the video, and it had been featured, it had been liked 15,000 times. No way. Wow. Uh, and it was somebody in America that put it together, comparing property prices in America to England, so I put it out there on social media and said, crikey, is TikTok a platform that we should be using if it's reaching this many people? Did it generate any leads, though, crucially? No. Like Okay, so that's the, that's the problem. I, I think your age demographic and your, your audience there yeah. is very different. Yeah. I know that Ben loves it at Starbury. He does yeah. see none of it. And, he, and they keep saying this is where, you know, in the way that a lot of people were ignoring Instagram, and of course then people start, again, the Aussies were talking about, well, for real estate and estate agency, property porn, Instagram is absolutely perfect. So, you know, I've never really understood. It seems exactly the same as Twitter to me, but that's me being an old, an old, an old bastard anyway. Um, so John, just, just to go back before uh, David so rudely interrupted, can we get you back on another show and go through a few of those? Uh, <laughs> go through those. And because you know, because we're special, can you do one more than it was from that conference? Just so yeah, better? yeah, absolutely. Well, again, it can be twenty-two top tips for two thousand and twenty, with the added two of washing your hands and staying inside. Right. Um, if, if you if you want to send in, because uh, Jerry Lyon seems to be bored. So he sends in these very many videos that he does. But if you want to send him one tip a day, we will filter it out to our audience. There you are. There you are. Happy, happy to get involved. I'd love to come back as well. And, I'd love to come back as well and tell you a little bit more about Property Thread once that's up and running. Make, sorry, just on that, for everybody there, yeah. Look, anyone who's interested, drop us a, an email back to podcast at kapuffle.it. We'll forward those on to John. So when the time's right, he'll get some information. I'm sure you'll be able to do that, won't you, John? 
Yeah, look, we need some early adopters for it to work. We want it to grow organically from across the country in like some key locations. If you know, we do have a like a trail base raise program at Kerfuffle where we get some agents who are really keen to try new technology and and give you honest feedback. So if you want to pick I, up, I love I love how he calls his grooming program the trailblazing program. <laughs> Yeah, so so you've got a few agents on that. Yeah, thanks for the invite, Simon, because I've never heard of that until now. All the big agents, uh, yeah. So okay, mate, that's absolutely. I think that's our longest. Is that our longest show, David. Well done, John. You've made that um, painful experience seem seem lovely. Um, okay, that's that's yeah. I'm professional at that. So uh, guys, thanks you for having me. Uh, long time fan of the show, and I will continue to listen moving forward. And sorry if it uh, wasn't quite the the highbrow thing that you were looking for. No, no, no it's, it's it's perfect. Right on the money. Cheers, chap. Thank you. No worries. Bye, bye. Thank you.